kicked off his career as the inspiration for the boy who wouldn't grow up or the real Peter Pan in Finding Neverland. Starring alongside Johnny Depp once again as Charlie, let loose in the chocolate factory. Now, Freddie Highmore's put that precocious talent to use on the small screen as a regular on hit series and TV shows with one standout alter ego, Sean Murphy, a.k.a. The Good Doctor. He sticks to his gut and he fights for what he thinks is right. They have a solution. You didn't care that it might mean the end of your career? Unforgivable. Freddie Highmore, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you very much. I could introduce you as the writer or the director of The Good Doctor, <laughs> but I think you're better known as the star of that show, even though you've dabbled in those other areas. Now, after two seasons, what sort of medical insight do you have? Could you save someone's life? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I would be absolute. I hope you're, you seem very, you know, healthy and, and fine. So I, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'd be completely useless in any, in any real medical situation. You haven't learned one life-saving skill? Well, I feel like actually it, the more that the show goes on, the more dangerous it would be for me to try and help people and that you feel like you've got this knowledge, but it's all slightly fake and, you know, shortcutty and obviously serves ultimately to tell a 10 hour surgery in two minutes on screen. And so I would think I know what I would be doing, but I'd probably most likely be doing it wrong. So I will leave it to, to, the, to the real people. <laughs> I'm Dr. Sean Murphy. I have autism. I can help people with medicine, but I made a mistake. The only question I have is, who exactly is to blame? Now is the time to take St. Bonaventure to the forefront of the medical profession. You've exceeded my expectations, but your communication skills are sorely lacking. Things might be more difficult for you now. I was honest. It just made it worse. Now, The Good Doctor tackles the very serious issue of autism, and it's a very sensitive subject because I think society is starting to discuss whether it's a mental health question or a neurological uh, condition. How did you approach that when creating your character? Were you involved in the conversations about how his autism would be displayed? I think we all felt a great responsibility um, and knew what a, what a responsibility it was taking on the, the character of Sean and, and, of course, portraying autism um, on screen through him. I think one of the key things that we, that we realised from the very start was that Sean can't represent everyone who is on the spectrum in the same way a neurotypical lead character of a television show would never be able to represent everyone who is neurotypical in the world. The same, of course, goes for Sean with respect to autism. And so we sort of, you know, ultimately were focused on telling his unique individual story and, uh, and obviously hoping that it has, that it has wider resonances and, and maybe sparks some form of conversation around autism more, more generally. Now, Sean is genius level intelligent, but a bit hampered when it comes to social interactions because of his autism. And one of the symptoms is that he can't lie. Now, we complain often about living in this mm -hmm. post-truth society, but his honesty and bluntness is a bit jarring for the people around him. Why do you think that is? I mean, I feel one of the, one of the stereotypes, perhaps, that we are seeking to counter in, with, with respect to to autism is that somehow people with autism are devoid of emotion or don't experience emotion in, in any way. And so whilst, of course, the sort of external um, effects on those around him when Sean, as you're saying, like maybe speaks more bluntly than, than people are used to, um, I think underneath what we're trying to do is, is ultimately get inside Sean's head and see how and understand how he is thinking differently and what the emotions are that are that are guiding him to, to perhaps come across in a, in a certain way. And, um, and of course, as the show goes on, Sean will, um, and has already kind of ad adapted to the rules and codes of the, of the hospital environment that he's in and, and, and adjusted his behavior as such in order to try and fit in. But I also think that he's changed those around him and that's what we, what we hope to achieve too. It isn't that Sean needs to solely change and adjust and try and become someone that he's not. I think his different viewpoint on the world can help others learn and, and grow. 
Being a TV doctor is, of course, great for impressing your parents because all parents dream of their children studying medicine and going on to the uh, noble profession of being a doctor. So what did your parents think when you announced you were going to be an actor? I mean, I think, I, obviously, as a kid, it, it wasn't this sort of choice that that meant I wasn't doing anything else. And I kept going to school and university. And I guess they were pleased that I had the option to do other things. And, um, you know, so far, so far, so good as I go off along this path. Yeah. Now, you spent time in the writer's room on this series, as well as being an actor. And that's something you did in a previous series, Bates Motel. How difficult is it for you to change roles when you're in a group dynamic on the set? How do you flick that switch and become the guy who's in charge? I mean, it's, um, you know, it, it, it's a wonderful group that we have in Vancouver. Um, the previous show I did, Bates Motel, was, uh, was with a lot of the same crew as well. So we've been, you know, I, I feel very supported and it's obviously, you know, very much a collaboration working with everyone. So it's not too weird, I guess, switching between the two, the two roles. Not as weird as it may seem. Do you put on a tie or...? No, but apparently my British accent comes out more when I'm directing. So, because I try and stay in the American as much as possible, um, so it becomes second nature for for the character and when acting. But supposedly my British side, you know, sneaks out sneaks out more. I don't know whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> now, Bates Motel is a drama thriller series that it serves as a sort of prequel to Alfred Hitchcock's uh, Psycho, the film. It's been hugely successful, five seasons, but it is some quite dark, creepy material. Mm. What's the appeal of that sort of uh, material as an actor? I, I always think there's this underlying dark humour to Bates Motel that um, I think if you look at the posters and the way that the show is presented and sold, of course, it, it leads into the horror more than anything else. But ultimately, I don't think the story was as, was as dark as... Uh, as people may see. Maybe I'm just deluded and Norman has, um, you know, rubbed off on me too much. But, uh, <laughs> but no, I feel like it, it was, of course, a tragedy, this tragic love story, but, but there was some hope in it and there was certainly a lot of humour along the way that Vera Farmiga, who's obviously brilliant, you know, was uh, brought so much of to the show. And going back to the beginning of your career, you started acting as a child in films like Finding Neverland and uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, both of them alongside Johnny Depp. But you also did TV roles at the same time. I, th I feel like in recent years, you've committed a lot more time to series. Was mm -hmm. that a conscious choice, series over cinema? Perhaps The Good Doctor was, um, in the sense that I had an awareness of what being on a television show was about, whereas Bates Motel was the first one that I'd done. Uh, but I really enjoyed, you know, obviously my experience on Bates and so far on, on this show in that it, you know, you just, it allows you much, a much greater amount of time to really focus on, on telling the story of your character. And instead of rushing a transition of, you know, multiple episodes and multiple seasons into these the sort of 90 minute film, I guess it gives you a different perspective on, uh, on, yeah, on, on building a character and having the time to do that. Speaking of finding Neverland, there is a very moving moment at the end of the film, which I'm sure you'll remember where mm -hmm. uh, the Jim Barry character comforts oh, that's right. yes. your <laughs> character on a bench, uh, Johnny Depp uh, playing that scene with you. That scene has been doctored and shared millions of times on the internet. It's become a meme uh, showing your sadness and despair in that moment. And I think it's because your sadness is so convincing. How did you, <laughs> how did you train yourself to cry as a child? Did you have a trick? I, someone has shown me that I wasn't really aware of what the these memes were until recently. So, um, but now I'm aware, yeah, there's like the three different things, stages or whatever. I don't know, I mean, it's hard, I guess it's always hard to, to sort of talk, or I find it difficult anyway, to talk about that process of being there on set and, and getting into that emotional place. I feel like, you know, as with all characters, you do a huge amount of research beforehand, but then ultimately when you're there on the day, you have to kind of rely on, on instinct and be free to, you know, to be in the moment and react. And, and I, guess, I guess I never felt with that scene, or from what I can remember <laughs> from many years ago, a sort of pressure to achieve a certain outcome, or it's, it's not like you must cry at this moment or that moment. And so 
I guess it's just trying to be as genuine as possible and not really worrying about what, what might be coming out. Looking ahead to uh, upcoming work, you're working on an adaptation, or you have worked on an adaptation, of the Oscar Wilde story, The Canterville Ghost, I believe, with some very renowned comic actors, Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, and uh, Miranda Hart. Was there an awful lot of pressure to be funny around them? Well, it's funny you mention this, because we haven't really started on that in earnest, and I haven't actually met any of those people. So, um, so I, will, I will let you know when I meet them how funny or how unfunny I feel. <laughs> You're someone who studied languages, I believe, and I heard that you speak excellent French. So can we be expecting any foreign language performances from you anytime soon? I would love to, yeah. I haven't really had the opportunity to do that, but, um, but absolutely, yes. If you find me a, a great foreign language project in French or Spanish, I will be there. French yeah. directors, be aware. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. This just sounds very much like a plea, but, um, but yes, please do. Thank you. <laughs> Freddie Highmore, thank you very much for no, joining thanks us. Thanks a lot. Cheers.